I am Dr. Charles Feynman, the chair of the Virtual Grand Rounds Sessions on Type 2 Diabetes. I am a former chairman of the Department of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism at the Cleveland Clinic and currently a consultant in the department. This is the third lecture in our current series of CME-approved case-based management presentations dealing with type 2 diabetes. It has been estimated that 20 to 30 percent of adult hospitalized patients have diabetes, with the vast majority having type 2. Moreover, an additional 10 to 15 percent have newly recognized hyperglycemia. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimates the cost of health care expenditures for diabetes amounts to a staggering $116 billion annually. The burden for inpatient care amounts to one half of the total, approximating $58 billion per year. It has become abundantly clear that appropriate management of glycemia in hospitalized patients with a variety of medical or surgical conditions results in better clinical outcomes of morbidity and mortality. Therefore, today's topic of inpatient management of the patient with type 2 diabetes is both timely and relevant. It is my pleasure now to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Cecilia Lansang. Dr. Lansang is a staff member in the Cleveland Clinic's Endocrinology and Metabolism Institute, having joined the clinic in 2010. She is currently the director of the Inpatient Diabetes Services. She has the honor of having established one of the first inpatient diabetes services in the country while obtaining her MPH degree at Harvard. Clearly, her background and experience make her an ideal speaker for today's presentation. Dr. Lansing. This is Dr. Cecilia Lansing, and I would like to thank you for listening in on this video conference. This talk will be the inpatient management of patients with type 2 diabetes. I currently direct the inpatient services for diabetes for the Department of Endocrinology, and I chair the Diabetes Care Committee for the Cleveland Clinic. Our objectives for today are to identify patients requiring glucose management while hospitalized, uh, to delineate the glucose target levels that are appropriate for these patients, and also to discuss strategies to lower glucose levels for hospitalized patients. What we will do is go through a case scenario. MK, a 62-year-old white male, is admitted for coronary artery bypass graft surgery. He has had chest pains for a year, reports urinating five times a day and thinking that this is due to his diuretic. He uses reading glasses. He has not seen an eye doctor lately. He denies any neuropathic symptoms. He complains of some knee pain. For his history, he has had dyslipidemia, a 10-year history of hypertension, and knee osteoarthritis. He has not been told to have diabetes, although his primary care physician said two years ago that his blood glucose is for borderline. As we continue with the case, we see that he is mostly sedentary at work. He buys fast food from the cafeteria, but at home for dinner, he tries to eat more healthy. He tries to walk with his wife on weekends, but he does have knee pain that limits his exercise. He has a family history of type 2 diabetes. His medications are metoprolol, hydrochlorothiazide, atorvastatin, and aspirin. For his preoperative labs, we see a fasting glucose of 145 milligrams per deciliter and a serum creatinine of 1.6 milligrams per deciliter. So the first question I have is, will you manage this patient 
as having type 2 diabetes. Several physicians might have different answers to this question. This is the reason why I am putting up this slide that a lot of you will be familiar with already for the American Diabetes Association criteria for the diagnosis of diabetes. It now includes a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5% as one of the criteria, along with the other previously known criteria for diagnoses, which include a fasting plasma glucose above 126 or a two-hour OGTT plasma glucose of greater than 200 or a random plasma glucose greater than or equal to 200 if you have classic symptoms of hyperglycemia or with a hyperglycemic crisis. The ADA does recommend that in the absence of an equivocal hyperglycemia, that the results should be confirmed by repeat testing. And that test may be a different one from the initial test that was performed. So in this case scenario, some providers might already be comfortable diagnosing this patient to have diabetes. After all, the clinical scenario does point to him having risk factors for diabetes, but others might wish to get another test to confirm the diagnosis. This will be shown in the next slide. This patient is now status post-surgery and is in the intensive care unit. He is receiving IV infusions of epinephrine and norepinephrine. His random plasma glucose is 188 milligrams per deciliter, and insulin infusion intravenously is started. You now have his labs back from the labs that were drawn preoperatively, and his hemoglobin A1C comes back at 7.5%. So he does have at least two laboratory levels showing that he has diabetes. Given the clinical picture, he likely has type 2 diabetes. The next question for you is, what are appropriate glucose targets in the intensive care unit? A, 80 to 110 milligrams per deciliter, B, 80 to 180, C, 100 to 180, D, 100 to 220. I will let you think about that before we proceed. The correct answer is C, 100 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. In the next few slides, I will discuss why this is so. There are different societies that have given out statements and guidelines for target glucose levels. They are not necessarily identical to each other, but most of them do suggest glucose levels that are within 100 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. In 2009, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and the American Diabetes Association put out the consensus statement for blood glucose targets in critically ill patients being 140 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. They do go on to say that somewhat lower glucose targets may be appropriate in selected patients. And they do say that levels less than 110 milligrams per deciliter are not recommended. The American College of Physicians put out the clinical practice guideline in 2011 recommending 140 to 200 milligrams per deciliter being the blood glucose target in critically ill patients. And the Endocrine Society said that they will support an upper level of 180 milligrams per deciliter for critically ill patients. Just recently, in 2012, 
The Society of Critical Care Medicine also put out their guidelines saying that a blood sugar level of less than 150 milligrams per deciliter using a protocol achieving a low rate of hypoglycemia is what they recommend. These guidelines put out by the different societies have been released as a result of multiple studies in the intensive care unit. In our institution, we continue to maintain a protocol that has its target as 110 to 150 milligrams per deciliter because internal quality assurance studies have indicated that our protocol is working without excessive hypoglycemia and with glucose levels being kept in target. We continue the case scenario. Our patient's insulin infusion is about to be discontinued at this point. And you want to give him a long-acting insulin for his basal insulin needs. His vasopressors were discontinued eight hours ago. The next question is, how do you calculate basal insulin in this situation? Letter A, extrapolate this based on the IV insulin infusion dosing over the past 24 hours and reduce by 20%. Letter B, extrapolate the basal insulin dose based on the IV insulin infusion over the past six hours and reduce by 20%. Letter C, give basal insulin at 0.1 to 0.15 units per kilogram per day. Letter D, give basal insulin at 0.3 to 0.5 units per kilogram per day. Letter E, A or D. Letter F, A or C. Letter G, B or C. And letter H, B or D. I'll give you a few seconds to think about this since there are several choices. The correct answer is letter G, B or C. There are several ways that we can compute basal insulin doses for patients who are coming off the insulin infusion. In patients who have not been on diabetes medications in the past and who have not been on subcutaneous insulin, we can base this on the dose of the insulin infusion or give a dose based on weight. The reason why letter B is a better answer than letter A is because the patient had been on vasopressors in the past and these were just discontinued eight hours ago. Epinephrine can increase your insulin needs and therefore we would like to get a span of time that the patient was not on epinephrine. The reason for decreasing the dose by 20% is to account for possible clinical improvement for the next several hours. Comparing C and D, it is better to give lesser of a dose for this patient whose creatinine levels are above normal. If the patient had normal creatinine or estimated GFR, and especially if the patient had been treated in the past with either oral diabetes agents or insulin or non-insulin injectables, letter D would have been a better answer. In this case, for this patient, the best answer would be G, which is either letter B, extrapolate based on IV insulin infusion over the past six hours and reduce by 20%, or C, give basal insulin 
0.1 to 0.15 units per kilogram per day. The Endocrine Society does recommend insulin therapy as the preferred method of achieving glucose control in patients who are hospitalized and who have hyperglycemia. The Endocrine Society recommends insulin therapy as the preferred method for achieving glucose control when patients are hospitalized. The Endocrine Society suggests discontinuation of oral hypoglycemic agents and initiation of insulin treatment for most of the patients with type 2 diabetes when they are admitted for an acute illness to the hospital. Dr. Ompieres et al. suggests the following for starting insulin doses in the hospital for patients who are at least 70 years old with compromised renal function, they suggest a lower dose of 0.2 to 0.3 units per kilogram per day of total daily dose. As a clarification, this is for total daily doses. Remember that basal insulin doses are often half or 50% of the total daily dose. For patients who are less than 70 years old or who have good kidney function, their recommendation is to start insulin doses of 0.4 units per kilogram per day, total daily dose, if the blood glucoses are around 140 to 200 milligrams per deciliter and 0.5 units per kilogram per day for total daily dose if the blood sugars are higher than that. Other considerations might be to also give a lower dose for patients who have no known previous diagnosis of diabetes at a total daily dose of 0.2 units per kilogram per day. For patients with known type 2 diabetes and already were on insulin at home, you might try to use their total daily dose of insulin at home as a starting point and adjust these doses by 10 to 20 percent depending on the clinical situation. For example, if the patient reports hypoglycemia at home, you might want to reduce their total daily dose by around 20%. This total daily dose can then be divided into half basal and half prandial or nutritional. We continue on with our case. Insulin doses of his vasopressors average around 0.8 units per hour over the past six hours. And his glucose levels range from 136 to 177 during that period. His weight is 125 kilograms. He is now to be sent to the surgical floor. He only has a little bit of appetite. You give him 14 units of long-acting insulin subcutaneously, and you discontinue the insulin infusion after two hours of that subcutaneous injection. You also give orders for correction scale rapid-acting insulin with each meal. You do not yet give a fixed dose of scheduled rapid-acting insulin because you are not sure how much he is going to eat. And then he is sent to the general surgical floor. So how did we arrive at 14 units? This is a computation based on a combination of the insulin infusion that he was getting and his weight-based dose. If he was receiving 0.8 units per hour, extrapolated to 24 hours times 24, and a reduction of 20% times 0 0.8. 0 
units per hour times 24 hours times 0 0.8 would give us 15 units. If we are to give him insulin based on weight, we can choose the lower end of the range of 0 0.1 to 0 0.15 units per kilogram. And we would come up with about 13 to 14 units. The correction scale can be the typical scale used in a lot of institutions for type 2 diabetes. Hospitals might use a starting glucose level of 151 to 200 milligrams per deciliter and give around two units for those glucose levels and increase the insulin by two unit increments for every 50 points of blood sugar. Some hospitals use a calculation derived from what we call is the rule of 1800. In the rule of 1800, you divide 1800 by the estimated total daily insulin dose of the patient, which can again be based on weight, and that will give you the amount of glucose that one unit will decrease. For example, if a patient weighed 100 kilograms and you decided to give the patient a total daily dose of 0 0.3 units per kilogram per day, 100 times 0.3 will give 30. And if you divide 1,800 by 30, you will be giving this patient one unit of insulin for every 60, 60 milligram per deciliter increment in blood sugar above the goal that you set for him. We now move on to the general floors. What are the appropriate glucose targets on the general floors? Remember that we were talking about the intensive care unit a while ago. For this situation, we are asking for the appropriate glucose targets on the general medical and surgical floors. Is it A, 80 to 110 milligrams per deciliter, B, 80 to 180, C, 100 to 180, and D, 100 to 220? The appropriate answer is C. Just like with the intensive care setting, several societies have put out guidelines for care of patients in the general floors. In 2009, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and the American Diabetes Association had released their consensus statement on glucose targets in non-critically ill patients. They suggest pre-meal blood sugars to be less than 140, random blood sugars if taken to be less than 180, and they suggest reassessing the regimen when the blood sugars are less than 100 and modifying the regimen when the blood sugar is less than 70 unless this is an easily explained event such as missing a meal, but then having been given uh, insulin inadvertently. The two recommendations of reassessing the regimen or modifying the regimen when the blood sugars start to go low address our concerns about hypoglycemia prevention and management in the hospital. In 2012, the Endocrine Society released their clinical practice guideline suggesting pretty much of the same recommendations as the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and the American Diabetes Association. Again, suggesting reassessment of the regimen or modifying the regimen 
when the blood sugar start to get low. And also recommending pre-meal blood glucose levels of less than 140. In 2011, the American College of Physicians Clinic Practice Guideline recommended not using intensive insulin treatment to strictly control glucoses in patients who are on the general floors. Stated avoiding blood sugars of less than 140. Now, this is in contradistinction to the three other societies that I had just discussed. I must say that when the American College of Physicians published their guidelines, the results of the RABBIT-2 surgery trial was not yet out. And I am not sure if the results of that trial would have uh, changed the American College of Physicians statement. The RABBIT-2 surgery trial randomized patients with type 2 diabetes to either basal bolus insulin or sliding scale insulin. And the patients who received basal bolus insulin had less morbidity outcomes than the patients on sliding scale insulin. For our institution, we do recommend pre-meal blood sugar levels generally less than 140 milligrams per deciliter. But we do tell our residents that this goal could be adjusted depending on the patient's present clinical situation and also their glycemic control at home. For patients who have been well controlled in the ambulatory setting and who have not had frequent hypoglycemic events and are aware of hypoglycemic symptoms, they may be more appropriate for blood glucose levels near the 100 mark, whereas patients who have had poor control and who have frequent hypoglycemia at home or who have hypoglycemia unawareness may need to be given glucose target levels that are higher than 140 milligrams per deciliter pre-meals. We go on with the case scenario. Your patient is on the general floor now. He is eating more and has a diet that's more predictable. You had already added scheduled rapid-acting insulin, which is now up to four units three times a day with his meals. Since his fasting blood glucose this morning was 82 milligrams per deciliter, you then reduce his long-acting basal insulin to 12 units once a day. He has already received teaching on diabetes basics, diet, cardiac rehab, and glucose monitoring. He says he will once again try to improve his diet he does not think that he can realistically start exercise because of his osteoarthritis and knee pain. He cannot get in to see his primary care physician for another two months. You think he will benefit from diabetes medication at discharge. Upon discussion with the patient, he told you he would prefer not to take shots. He is worried about low blood sugars because his brother who takes Oral diabetes medications needed EMS assistance once for hypoglycemia. So let us summarize the case and figure out what medications are appropriate for his discharge. This is a newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes case. The patient has a history of hypertension. He was admitted for coronary artery bypass graft. His A1T is 7.5% and his serum creatinine is 1.6. Which statement is correct about this patient's potential medication for discharge for diabetes? 
At this point, I am not asking about what medication you probably will send him out on, but to just focus on what statement is correct. A, metformin is the most appropriate diabetes medication for this patient. B, a sulfonyl urea will likely get his glucose levels down to go. C, a DPP-4 inhibitor is contraindicated. And D, insulin is necessary given his post-coronary artery bypass graft status. The correct answer is B. In this situation, metformin is not the best medication to give given his elevated creatinine levels. A DPP inhibitor is not contraindicated given the medical history that he has. It is not required that he take insulin simply because of his post-cabbage status. And it is true that sulfonylureas will likely get his blood sugars to go. That is not to say, again, that that is the medication that you would probably send him out on. And we will continue on with reviewing the pros and cons of the diabetes medications in light of this patient's situation. Metformin has the advantage of low hypoglycemia incidence, which he is worried about, but he does have an elevated creatinine level. Thiazolidine dions do have the potential concern for weight gain and edema or heart failure, although they have the advantage of low hypoglycemia incidence as well. Sulfonylureas are inexpensive, but may cause hypoglycemias. The glenides may also cause hypoglycemia, though relatively lower in incidence than sulfonylureas, but they require multiple dosing. A carbos has low hypoglycemia incidence but may cause troublesome diarrhea. DPP-4 inhibitors have low hypoglycemia incidence and can be dosed depending on renal status, but they may be expensive. GLP-1 agonists have low incidence of hypoglycemia, but they come in injection form. Bromocryptin quick release has low incidence of hypoglycemia, but are also relatively expensive. Colocevalam is weight neutral, but can have GI side effects. Insulin generally has no contraindication, but at this point, the patient does not need to be on shots right away. So after weighing the patient's concerns, which is hypoglycemia and the convenience, and your concerns for him, hypoglycemia, his weight, and his renal function, you decide to prescribe a DPP-4 inhibitor. He is expected to be discharged soon. You discontinue his long-acting insulin for 24 hours and then start him on a DPP-4 inhibitor and you stop his scheduled mealtime fast-acting insulin. His bedtime glucose last night was 156 milligrams per deciliter, and his fasting glucose this morning was 103. He is given a glucose meter and is discharged with prescriptions for the DPP-4 inhibitor, glucometer strips, and lancets. He is offered a follow-up clinic visit for his diabetes but the patient is unable to commute. 
He is provided with contact information in case he has questions while waiting to see his primary care physician. Although the Endocrine Society recommends stopping oral diabetes agents when a patient is acutely ill, in this situation when the patient is stable and is ready to go home, we have started patients on oral medications before their discharge, depending again on their clinical situation. For patients who need insulin, we have also started them on insulin treatment, including basal bolus four times a day, multiple daily insulin injections before discharging them home. This patient seems to be fit for oral agents, which is what was given. This patient has type 2 diabetes, but other populations to consider are patients with type 1 diabetes. These patients always need insulin, and we highly recommend to work with endocrinology to help manage these patients while they are in the hospital. Patients on insulin pumps, whether they have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, are another group of patients to consider consult to endocrinology or to at least follow hospital policy for safe continuation of pump use. These patients can continue the use of their insulin pump in the hospital, but have to be reminded to take off their pumps for certain radiologic procedures, such as MRI, and for certain surgical procedures, and in those situations, need orders for transitioning to subcutaneous multiple daily insulin injections as needed. Depending on the length of time, they will be off their insulin pump. Patients who have no known diagnosis of diabetes but have hyperglycemia from stress, enteral or parenteral nutrition, or glucose-raising medications such as glucocorticoids should also be managed as if they have diabetes and are best managed most of the time with insulin if they are acutely ill. As a word of caution, though insulin is recommended as the medication of choice, for most patients who are acutely ill in the hospital and have hyperglycemia, we do have to monitor for low blood sugars. And avoidance of hypoglycemia is a theme that underlies glucose management principles in the hospital. It starts from knowing how to detect signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia doing appropriate finger stick checks to determine trends in glucose levels, by being proactive and detecting patterns or anticipating changes in the patient's nutritional or medical status, we can prevent low blood sugars. Insulin dose adjustments should be done on at least a daily basis. And the hospital healthcare providers should know how to manage low blood sugars, either by giving intravenous dextrose or glucose tablets or juice or glucagon to these patients. In summary, type 2 diabetes management can be initiated during hospitalization even for patients who do not carry yet a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, diagnosis and management does not have to be delayed until months later in the outpatient setting. Guidelines are already available to assist healthcare providers in managing patients with hyperglycemia in the hospital and guidelines include recommendations for blood glucose targets for both critically ill 
in non-critically ill patients. Insulin is the recommended medication for managing patients with hyperglycemia or diabetes during the acute hospitalization. However, options for therapeutic agents have also been discussed as appropriate for discharge of these patients and have been summarized in this presentation. Thank you for listening in. If you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lansang, for the excellent review of management techniques for the hospitalized patient with type 2 diabetes. Permit me to summarize and reflect upon a few key points and take-home messages. Ideally, each hospital facility should provide appropriate training, particularly of the nursing staff, in order to develop site-appropriate management protocols for both acute care and ward care areas. Guidance for this may be obtained from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists Diabetes Resource Center. Insulin is the treatment of choice for glycemic management of the hospitalized patient with diabetes. An insulin infusion in the acute care setting with appropriate monitoring and rate adjustments provides optimal control. Above all, do no harm. Hypoglycemia must be avoided. As Dr. Lansang reviewed, target glucose values have been debated, but values in the 100 to 180 milligrams per deciliter range seem appropriate for most situations. Caution must be exercised in the transition from intravenous to subcutaneous routes of insulin administration. Accordingly, appropriate planning and coordination must be done. The subcutaneous administration of intermediate or long-acting insulin should be administered two to three hours prior to discontinuation of the IV insulin in order to avoid the rapid development of hyperglycemia and even ketoacidosis, particularly in the type 1 patient. The concept of sliding scale insulin administration should be abandoned. This regimen only serves to chase down elevated values. Rather, a basal bolus regimen is recommended with the total doses of each usually divided on a 50-50 basis. Bolus doses should be taken into account the carbohydrate content of consumed food and correctional dose adjustments made as needed based on the ambient glucose value at that time. Therapeutic recommendations at discharge should take into account the prior outpatient regimen and the adequacy of control on admission. The need for basal insulin usually at a reduced dose from the hospital requirement, should be considered at that time. The newly diagnosed patient needs to be taught monitoring and survival skills prior to discharge. Referral to an outpatient diabetes education facility is recommended. Lastly, it should be emphasized that appropriate communication of the treatment plan with a primary care physician must be done at discharge in order to make the transition as error-free as possible. Regarding the future, it seems to me that we are getting closer to the time when closed-loop technology, also dubbed the artificial pancreas, will become available for general use. As of February 28th, 2013 article in the New England Journal of Medicine indicates the use of this type of technology in children and adolescents with diabetes attending summer camps can result in improved glycemic control. If such a difficult group of patients can benefit from this technology, then we should not be so far away from its use in the hospital setting. In closing, on behalf of myself, 
Dr. Lansing and the Cleveland Clinic, I wish to thank you for attending this virtual Grand Rounds session.